again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk. Bible Talk out in the middle of the ocean. Um, if you hear squeaks and groans, it's not us. It's the ship. It's, it's, the ship. it's the ship that we're aboard. We're off the coast of Spain and headed for Brest, France. Um, so that, that may account for some of the odd noises that you hear and the different location that you see missing. And our Bob and Pam is Oh, yeah, and Bob and Pam are here because we have joined, we were joined to be on the ship headed for France and then for England, uh, where we will be spending time sharing the power and the love of Jesus Christ. We're continuing on in our study of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, this is our, our 18th part of the study, and we're just entering the sixth chapter of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And I just want to recap a little bit from where we left off, as I said I would in our, in our last session, as we ended in chapter 5. But before we do that, I'm going to ask Father if you would just lead us in a little prayer to ask for God's blessing upon this time in His Word. Well, Father, we thank You that You love us, care for us, and desire to abide with us, Lord God. And Father, we pray that the presence of the Holy Spirit would lead us and guide us into all truth. Father, we ask these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 The thing I said I would recap um, when we left off in, in chapter 5, we were talking about the things that we looked at, about Jesus saying, you know, we are to pray for our enemies. We're not to resist evil. And I talked about how taxation, even though it was oppressive, and the, and the first century Christians lived in oppressive times. They lived under some of the worst dictators that the world has ever known. And yet still, God moved through them. They, were, they spoke through the Holy Spirit to say over and over, be submiss submissive to governing authorities. And one of the things I talked about, us being Americans, and I, I related to that, but it's not exclusive to America by any means, is the fact that the very things that Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount that we should not do are the things that the American colonists said were godly justifications for them to rebel against King George. <clears throat> and this is not a history lesson, but it's an opportunity for us to look at something very, very important. And that is, we have to be submitted to the Word of God. We may have outcomes that seem pleasing to us, but we're called in, by Solomon in Proverbs not to lean on our own understanding. And we never, you know, it's, we'll know the eternal consequence of our actions. Very soon. In eternity, yeah. Um, but as I was saying, rebellion is his witchcraft. And we, we have to be very, very prayerful about the actions that we take because we think we are justified in doing it. Because the ways of the world and the ways of the Word are not just different, they are contrary. They are contrary. And just as a, a little bit of history, for those of you who don't know it, you know, the colonists were not unanimous in any, in any way in their rebellion against King George. There was a great number of people, and it was typically based on theological reasons, who resisted the, re, the, the revolution. Now, you know, we, the, the Americans won that, so it's called the American Revolution. Had they lost, it would have just simply been called the Colonist Rebellion. But this, Actually, it was called Canada. Well, but because <laughs> it, the thing is, you know, the, the victors get to write the history books. But in eternity, you know, it's God who gets to write his own word. So that, that history will be seen. We just have to be very, very prayerful because we need to understand that we are called to something very, very different. And we often let our flesh, our nature, our human nature, which is, by the way, our fallen human nature, guide what we do, rather than letting God's Word, a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, letting that guide what we do. And 
my, my interest here is not to look back a few hundred years at what happened, but to make us think about what's happening today and how we respond to what's happening today. Because think about what, how Christ would respond to what's going on in the world, to the evil people in the world. Remember, if, if we, I think it's been clear in our study in the Sermon on the Mount so far that our nature is, our, our natural instinct is to classify evil. That person's very evil, this person's not very evil, and after all is said and done, I'm good. <laughs> well, the fact of the matter is, I am not good. Because Jesus said, no man is good, right? So, we make a distinction that I don't believe that the Lord does make, which is why he talked about, you know, looking at a woman with lust is the same as adultery. Being angry is the same as murder. And when you take it in that context, and we rejoice over these evil people, quote-unquote evil people, perishing. The heart of God is that He desires that none should perish, but all come to everlasting life. The ministry of the Church of God is a ministry of reconciliation. To bring the presence of Christ Jesus, who was sent into this world and died on a cross, that we might be reconciled to God the Father. Because God is a God of peace. And Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And that is what we are supposed to represent. All right, so I just said I wanted to uh, just bring that up and cover that before we went on because I'd kind of run out of time in our last session talking about that. So we're going to move on to chapter 6. And in chapter 6, and remember, when Jesus said this, it's not broken up the verses in chapter. He didn't say this and take a break and then come back and say, okay, well, let's move on to the next verse. This is a con one continuous teaching that he's doing here. Mm -hmm. So he continues on. Now, and, and we talked about, you know, this is truly a movement from looking religious to living righteous. And what Jesus is doing now, having, having come to give righteousness as a free gift, he is training us in how to live that righteousness. Because when you've been given new life in Christ Jesus, it requires a new lifestyle. Okay? So he says, be, and, and again, I'm reading from the New American Standard Version of the Bible. And it says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. And then he goes on, and we'll get into this in a second. When you give to the poor, when you pray, when you fast, you know, it's about that. But if he says, and I think this is a good translation, practicing your righteousness. You see, because when we are, we are first born again, we are babes in Christ. And there is a process of maturity and growing in Christ. And like anything, practice is important. Jesus just got through saying, be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And I'm sure you've heard the saying, practice makes perfect. In Hebrews 5.14, it's written, the solid food of the Word is for the mature, for the mature who because of practice has trained his senses to discern between good and evil. So, you know, we have this righteousness which was a gift from the Father. We've been made right with the Father. And that should lead to action, to works. Faith without works is dead being by itself. So we need to go out and make a habit and grow and practice doing the things that are the fruit of the righteousness, the love of God that's been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, as Paul says in his letter to the Romans, right? So we need to practice this. It's an ongoing thing. It's not an act. It's a life. It's not a single thing that you do. It's a life that you lead. But don't beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them, right? Mm -hmm. It's not about us being seen by people and what we're doing. But interestingly enough, think about this. Jesus had just said moments ago in the, in the time frame of this thing actually happening, just in, in chapter 5, back in verse 16, he said, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good work and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So he's not saying that people aren't supposed to see the righteousness that we do. What it really boils down to is who gets the credit. Are we doing these things because we want people to see us and think about us? Or are we doing these things because we want people to be touched by God and see God? It's about who's, 
When you do these things, when you practice and God uses you, whose work is it? It's God's work. Well, then why do we ever take the glory? Why do we? Yeah, why do we take the credit? We know the answer to that. A simple little word. Pride. Yes. Begins with a P and it ends with an E. Got an R I D in the middle. <laughs> that could make a song. song. Huh? <laughs> you know, I just want to share, share this. Years ago, uh, Alice and I were living in California. We had started that ministry that many of you know about, the M.D. Solomon Institute, which is and uh, what is now the biggest Christian radio station or company in the world, I believe, Salem, Salem Communications. It was much smaller back then because of the regulations regarding communications. And they wanted to sponsor one of the seminars that I did, um, basically out of the headquarters in Oxnard, California. So I went down, we were living up in Modesto, and I drove down to Oxnard and I met with the general manager of uh, Salem Communications. And a nice young guy. I mean, really, and we really hit it off. And it's the first time I met him, and I was sitting in his office, and we had coffee, and we had fellowship, and we were just sharing. And of course, he didn't know me, but they were talking about now sponsoring one of the seminars I do. So he's trying to get to know me. And at that time, we had come back recently from living in Central America out in the bush as missionaries. And, uh, I had a, an adventure or two, mm -hmm. and we're going on, and he's asking me all these questions, and he looked at me and he said, how come I never heard of you? And that stopped me a minute, and I, I said to him, well, have you ever heard of Jesus? And he looked at me, you know, he said, of course I have. And I said, well, then I've been doing my job. <laughs> because my job is not to get you to hear about me or know me, nor is yours. It's not about getting people to recognize us and see us. It's about getting people to see Jesus Christ through what he's doing in us. And that is so important. It's not that you're not people aren't supposed to see your quote-unquote works. It's about who's supposed to be glorified when they see your works. Is it your work or is it his work? And all too often, it's our work. We come up with programs and we do things on our own that really aren't the Lord. And it's easy to call them the Lord, but that doesn't make it so. And I, and I was thinking about this verse, which is referring back to the time when Moses went up the mountain and came down with the commandments, right? It was coming down. Mm -hmm. And what did he find? He found the people of God, in their impatience and their failure to believe and trust in God, they're making an idol, right? There. And boy, talk about being great at excuses. Aaron said, you know, there's this golden calf. And he said, well, we just threw the gold into the fire and poof, out popped this calf. <laughs> but here's what it says in the New Testament about that very thing. At that time, they made a calf and brought a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the work of their hands. That's Acts 7.41. Get it? They were rejoicing in the works of their hands. Our own righteousness, our own righteous deeds... Isaiah says, are as filthy rags in Isaiah 64. Listen to these two verses. I just want you to think about this. In Colossians 1, in the first chapter of Paul's letter to the Colossians, it says, We proclaim him, the Lord, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose I also labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. You can never take credit because, you know, Paul is the epitome of being used by God in human history. I mean, you know, how many people have been used as Paul was? And what he's saying is, I, I have nothing that I can boast of. He said that over and over and over. You know, it's God working through me. In the book of Revelation, it says, and I'm going to read from the 15th chapter of Revelation, it says, And I saw something like a sea of glass, mixed with fire, and those who had been victorious over the beast in his image and the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, holding harps of God, and they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, Kings of the nation, king of the nations. It's all about God's work. It's all about God receiving the glory. The Lord said, "You shall not worship any other god, for the Lord, whose name is jealous, is a jealous God." 
Exodus 34, 14. God is a jealous God. Listen, he will share all of the benefits of, of the right relationship with his Father. He's not going to share the glory. Because all of the glory belongs to him. As we'll see when we get into the to that prayer that he said when you pray this way, right? So just just looking on, but think about that. It's we are to have people should see God working in us and God working through us. That's not what he's saying here when he says, you know, don't do your works in front of me to be seen by them. Because if you receive the glory, you've received your reward in full. That's it. So he goes on in, in Matthew 6, and I'm going to read verses 2 to 4. He says, So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, the, the first thing I, I want you to see there, it says, so when you give to the poor, there is this, the assumption that you'll be giving to the poor. Right. It's, it, Jesus did not say, if you give to the poor. He said, when. He said, when you give to the poor. This is practicing our righteousness. Because these are the things that he expects. Remember, he said, give to those who ask. He just got who's saying that, right? So now he's just going on. Yeah, that's why I said it's so important to see the Sermon on the Mount as a whole. Not just a couple of verses here and then a couple of verses over there. They're not independent. It's a, it's a piece, a single piece of cloth. He had, I said it started with the Beatitudes. It started with blessed are the poor in spirit. If you recognize that everything that you have possession of or stewardship of belongs to the Lord, and then he commands you to give to those who ask. You're not giving anything that belongs to you. Right? You know, Go ahead. I was going to say, when we first got saved, I remember um, going to a prayer meeting, and people, when if you mentioned to somebody, oh, I like your Bible, they would say, here, it's yours, you can have it. And, if, if, and I think that what they were doing is, when going by that scripture, when the Lord said, if anybody asks, just give it to them. But I think he's being more specific here when he's saying the poor, because those that's who's going to be asking, because those are the ones that are going to be in need. Well, poor. yeah. I, I mean, it's not just anybody mentions something that they like that you have, they immediately, oh, you can have and it. And that's not what Jesus and said. that's not what right. he's talking about. Right. Because when he talks about the poor, he's talking about people who have a need. A need, right. Right. Um, he doesn't say, you know, we don't have to give to those who don't have a need. Exactly. Uh, and the other thing, but it's it's important if you tie these things together, all right? His expectation is, first of all, that you recognize, blessed are the poor in spirit, that it's not yours. That, and he, his command to you is to give. And all through the New Testament, which I've said, we really get into this, what we're looking at, the New Testament is a commentary on the Sermon on the Mount. Or, or you know, it's, it, it's deeper. deeper and deeper instruction and in it's all in the Sermon on the Mount. And I, I use the example, and I think this is a good example, that if uh, if I were to write you a check, if I had money in the bank and I wrote you a check, I give you a check for $100, and you take it to the bank and you hand it to the cashier, right? And say to the cashier, you know, I want $100. The cashier is not going to sit there and think about, well, do I think this person ought to have it? Should I give it? Because it's not the, it doesn't belong to the cashier. They have just been entrusted with what belongs to somebody else. Right? We don't own anything when you recognize your poor in spirit. That God has given us stewardship, but it belongs to Him. And He's given you instruction to give to those who ask or who are in need. So now when somebody comes along, He expects this is going to happen. Right. And all you're doing is taking what belongs to the Lord at His instructions, like having a check in your hand mm -hmm. and giving it to that person. Mm -hmm. It hasn't, and by the way, one of the reasons you, you shouldn't boast about this, what have you seen? Because you haven't done anything. You haven't given away anything that belongs yeah, to you. Right. Yeah. Sure. You haven't given away anything that belongs to you. You know, so if, if Bob gave me $5 and said, do me a favor and just pass this on to somebody, and I give it to that person, I have no right to boast in having given them $5, right? 
And, and the other thing is, we have to get a perspective. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure most of you know the name Warren Buffett, right? Mm -hmm. Warren Buffett is bouncing back and forth, either the richest man in the world or the second richest man in the world. I mean, but he's right he's there. He's up there. Right there. And I saw an interview with him one time that just really touched my heart. Because it was at a time when he had taken, uh, I don't know how many billions, I, I believe it was 40 billion, billion dollars of his own personal wealth and given it to Bill and Melinda Gates for their foundation. He took 40 billion dollars of his own personal wealth and gave it to somebody for the work, that, for the good work they were doing. Which was the largest donation by an individual ever given, probably in the history of mankind. So he was being interviewed by a woman from CNBC, I believe, and she's standing there, a young woman, right? And she's just fascinated. She's going on and on and on about what a great guy he is, you know. You're, and he said, he, he said, and I'm paraphrasing, but he said, stop this right now. He said, you don't understand. He said this, is, this he said this on, on public television. He said, you don't understand. He said, I have never given so much that it put me in a position that I couldn't continue to do whatever I felt I wanted to do. I never gave out of I've never given out of my need. Mm -hmm. He said, there will be some little woman who goes to church this coming Sunday and put something in a basket, and she will have given more than I've ever given. And that just really touched my heart, because he, you know, he recognized yeah. that. Isn't that the same as Jesus in the story of the widow with her little mite? All these people are coming and boasting about how much they're giving and everything, and she comes along and drops her two pennies in it. And Jesus didn't say, well, it's like she gave. He didn't say it's like she gave more. He said she gave more than all the rest. So the Spirit of God, we've, we've talked about this, has poured His love into our heart. Our ministry here is a ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of the church is to express and show forth the love of God. The love of God is shown by giving. Do I have to explain it? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. We need to become givers, not, not people who just hold on to you know, for our own selves and not just do this. So, okay. So His expectation, but when you give to the poor. Don't 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 do it to be seen by men. I I have to tell you, and I'm just listen. I said I'm going to speak the truth in love, and you can like this, you can dislike it. That's whatever you want. Um, most of the things I say, if you dislike, I, I encourage you again, write to write to listen. I'm, write to Jesus at heaven dot org <laughs> and take it up with him. Because if I'm giving you the word, hey, don't blame me. But I don't like to go, and I've gone so many times, and I'll go to a church that's been built, and all over I see the names of the people who have donated. And this is one of the tools that is used by these churches to bring in donations. You're going to be recognized when you give. They've robbed you. Yes. They have robbed you of your reward in heaven mm -hmm. if you are doing this to be recognized by men. That's exactly what Jesus said. Give in secret. Your Father knows. And he's the one that you want to get that approval from. Paul wrote to Timothy and said, Show yourself approved unto God. Stop seeking the approval of men. Okay. All right, so what, what's the key here? As Al said it, right? The key is pride. It's an ins pride is an insidious sin, always knocking on the door, that would transfer the glory from the Lord to ourselves. That's what pride is. But in, I doubt today, but in the next section, we get into the prayer that Jesus said, when you pray, pray this way. How does that end? He says, for you are speaking to the Father. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. The glory always belongs to the Lord. You've got to get in the position where you refuse to accept that recognition and you point it to the Lord. All right, <clears throat> pride is the, the gateway to sin. It's the trickle down. Uh, remember, I said in Proverbs chapter six, I think it starts at verse sixteen. Proverbs six sixteen, 
There are six things that the Lord hates. Yea, even seven are an abomination. And the first one is haughty eyes. That's pride. And that's like, that starts and it opens the door to all other sin. It really does. Yes. And if we're talking about, just to keep this in a, a broad picture, the difference between being quote-unquote religious and being righteous. Religious people it's always about pride because it's always about what they can do to make themselves right. And you know what this goes back to? I mean, well, it goes back to the garden, but uh, how about the, the Tower of Babel? <coughs> when men said, we can, we can build a tower. We can make our own way into heaven. Well, when you try and live by the law and achieve this right relationship with God the Father by your own actions, that's what you're doing. It's all about pride and you're building a religion. I think we were having this conversation on, on the ship here the other day. I don't remember what the context was so much, but just the idea that humility, prime humility, those are the two topics. When we understand that there is nothing but grace, it says, you will never do anything in your life that creates a situation where you deserve, where you deserve God's salvation that right relationship with God the Father. You can't do it. No man can by any means redeem himself or his own brother. You can't do it. But when you think you can, then you start to build these religious things where you do something to achieve a right relationship with God the Father. And that's purely and simply pride. I'm going to skip ahead here momentarily to the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Because this, to me, is ought to give everybody pause for thought. In the end of the Sermon on the Mount, after Jesus teaches all of this, he gets and he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons? and in your name perform many miracles, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. All right, now think about this. We just started by talking about practicing righteousness, and now he's talking about practicing lawlessness. But these people who come to him on that day, come face to face with the Lord for the first time, what are they doing? They're boasting in their works. Look, they're coming into the presence of the King of Glory. They're coming into the presence of Jesus Christ standing there with nail-scarred hands, saying, look what I did. I prophesied. I cast out. Now, is there anything wrong with prophesying? No. Casting out demons? No. They're doing things that, by and large, we say, okay, these are the good things. These are the things God called us to do. So what turns it in from righteousness to lawlessness? Pride. And themselves. They don't come and say, you know, look what you did. Because I'm going to tell you something. Prophecy is speaking God's word, not your own. You have no power to cast out demons other than the power of the Holy Spirit or to do any of these things within you. So they're taking credit. So all these things that they have done, which we would look at and say, well, that's good things. It's not righteousness. They're not practicing righteousness. They're practicing lawlessness. Why? Because they've been deceived in their hearts. And they think that it's about them. This really, when I say this ought to give us a cause for thought, this ought to really make us examine how we are living our walk with Jesus Christ. And that are we pointing people to Jesus Christ all the time? I can tell you, you can, you can, uh, I said this, listen, I'm going to say it. You can turn on a lot of Christian television stations, and boy, it's a big event when, when the guy, whoever the guy happens to be, comes walking out on the stage, we've seen. The Word of God says that our ministry is to bring the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus into every place. Not to bring the knowledge of us. Oh, how we need to learn to point people to Jesus and away from ourselves. There is great, great danger. There are a lot of Christians out there today who are following a lot of people out there today instead of following the Lord Jesus Christ and His Word. 
Now, listen, I, I said this before. I'm a, if you think I'm saying this for condemnation, really you better go examine it again. I'm saying this for to encourage us all to do what the Word of God says, what the Apostle Paul said, to examine ourselves and make sure that we are not slipping into those prideful activities because pride is insidious. It just keeps pushing and pushing and pushing. And always, and it is our human, fallen human nature, one of the great signs of the last days. Oh, the mark of the beast, the fallen nations. No, you want know one of the great signs of the last days is? Men will be lovers of self. Second Timothy chapter 3. For in the last days, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of self. Homosexuality is increasing. The acceptance of homosexuality is increasing, abounding around the world. I mean, we're sitting here today as, as we do this Bible study now, and the Vice President and President of the United States of America have both come out and talked about their acceptance of, of gay marriage. Right? Homosexuality is a sin. That's what the Word of God says. That's what it says. But more importantly than that, I think, because there's a lot of sins that we've got to tolerate, right? Yes, yes. The, one of the differences with homosexuality is not only is it a sin, it is an indicator of a far greater sin. And that is in the first chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans, he says, because men have worshipped the creature rather than the Creator, that God has given them over to a depraved mind that led to this homosexuality. <clears throat> Even within the church, it may not look like this unless you're appraising things spiritually, but we're putting the focus on us. And you know what? God's a jealous God. He says, you're worshiping yourself. And the fruit of that is this abounding in homosexuality. Right? So, these are perilous times. I, I just, you know, I, I don't know how, I, I feel like I want to make this stronger and stronger and stronger. Because it, it is so dangerous. And it's crept into the church so very, very much. We have become a cult of personality. We have exalted personalities. Uh, I had the opportunity years ago to work for a Christian publishing company. And they publish, in addition to publishing books and uh, curriculum, and uh, they publish a number of magazines. And some, some good magazines. And the editor of one of their principal, their kind of their flagship uh, magazine, <clears throat> was a good friend of mine, and, and I thought a, a solid, you know, spiritually solid guy. Mm -hmm. So one month they had a, the, the cover article was about pride in the church, how we're focusing on men rather than focusing on the Lord. And what struck me, and I talked to him, and I, and I talked to, I reported to the president of the company, and, and I talked to him about it. Um, the back cover, the front cover, is this big front cover article. I don't remember what exactly how it was worded, but the pride, you know, how we exalt men and, and lift men. The back cover had been purchased by one of the major television ministries, evangelists in the country. And I mean, I, I turned this thing around and I, I counted and I showed it to him. The picture of this evangelist showed up nine times on the back cover. His photograph, different places, nine times on the back cover. His name, seven times. The name of Jesus Christ, Guse, zero, <laughs> zip, zilch, nada, nothing. No mention. I mean, you talk about the contrast and the evidence of the contrast. And yet it didn't seem to trouble anybody. Well, it troubled me. You know, it's just like, we, we recognize that this is a problem, but then we kind of just push it aside and don't deal with it. We need to deal with it. We need to start looking at the things that are not Christ-like in our lives and in the life of the body of the, of the church and the body of Christ. And we need to start dealing with these things. Isn't the people that exalt these leaders, so-called so leaders in the church, aren't they um, in sin also for doing this? Sure they are. Well, but uh, They are in sin. You know, it's not like, okay, they went out and mugged somebody, but it is giving to, to a human the glory that belongs to God. It's falling short. Sin is just falling short of the mark. Right. And it's easy to fall into that trap. It really is. 
And this is, this is one of the reasons we need really good fellowship with one another. You need to have people in your life who will love you enough to tell you when they see you doing these kinds of things. We absolutely have to have that. You should desire that. You know, discipline is not fun. Nobody in the natural, I think, likes discipline when it's happening. You don't want to hear that you're doing something wrong. David didn't like it, but I think one of the one of the really is this a proper way to say is this is religious enough? A really cool prayer of David was he prayed for God's discipline in his life, and he said, "Don't let my head reject it," because he knew that his tendency was to reject it. But you know that it says in Hebrews that God disciplines those whom He loves, and that discipline, oh, it may be uncomfortable for the moment. But praise God, it leads to a joy that, that it can only give when we've been corrected and we're doing things properly. So that's, that should be a desire in our lives. All right. Okay. Let's just uh, talk about this as I, as I go on. Okay, so we're all convinced that we should give? Okay. And the next question is, how much should you give? Now there are denominations, there, there are churches, there are cults that actually, I know one cult, uh, they actually demand to see your tax records at the end of the year to make sure that they got their fair share, they got their 10%. And people ask me a lot, you know, I've been teaching this word for a long time and I've had a lot of people ask me, well, what is the tithing now in the New Testament? Do they think, is, is tithing, give them 10%, is that, do we need to do that in the New Testament? I said, absolutely not, absolutely not. Jesus abolished that 10% thing. 100% now. Give it all. Give it all. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Nothing belongs to you. We're to give it all. And I always go back to what the Lord showed me, you know, one time when I asked Him, how much is enough? And Paul says, in his letter to the Philippians, in the second chapter, he says, have the same mind, have the same attitude in yourself that was in Christ Jesus. Not considering being equal with God a thing to be graced. He emptied himself. Okay? If you've emptied yourself, how much have you given? All. <clears throat> now, if you have stuff left, you haven't given all. Now, but bear in mind, I'm not I'm not saying that means you need to rush out the door right now. Don't go don't go yet. You don't need to rush right out the door and start throwing stuff out. You need to be directed and led by the Holy Spirit and prepared to give at the moment whatever God requires at the moment to whomever God shows you at the moment. Okay? That's not insanity. That's that's being faithful. That's being a faithful steward. And, you know, at the end of the day, I said pride is insidious and one of the things it leads to, pride leads to all sin. Yes. But it says that the love of money leads to all sorts of evil. Right? It's a, it's a root of all sorts of evil. Because when, you, when you're in love with yourself, the next thing you want is you want to accumulate for yourself, right? So, so now it's not about what you hold on to, it's about what you give away. If you don't, if you don't consider it your own, you, you can give it away. What are you doing? There is a focus here on eternity. The Sermon on the Mount uh, is, is a focus on eternity. One of, the, one of the things about giving, let me just see if I can get this and make this work. The thing that we're to give is the love of God. That can manifest itself in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Giving clothing can be giving the love of God. Giving food can be giving the love of God. But above all, since the focus of Jesus Christ, and it says, it's, it says, oh gosh, I always get this wrong. I think it says in Ecclesiastes or, that God has set eternity on our hearts. Giving food to a hungry man, and that's all you give them? Is not the love of God because it doesn't accomplish any eternal purpose. I said it's nice that there are there. I'm going to pick on everybody today. Why not? Uh, I have a lot of friends in the Salvation Army. I have preached in many, many churches of the Salvation Army. A lot of people don't even know that the Salvation Army is a church, but indeed it is. But it's a church that seems at the moment very divided to me. Because of the many people that I know in the Salvation Army, I find that there are people who are on fire for the Lord and, and very, very spiritual, and there are those who have kind of lost that zeal. 
Listen, it's called the Salvation Army. The focus of William Booth when he founded this in England oh so many years ago was salvation. Did he feed the hungry? Absolutely. <coughs> Did he clothe the naked? Absolutely. But his focus was salvation, eternity. If you've lost that focus, and now all you're doing is giving people food and clothing without giving them the word, all you're doing is sending fat, comfortable people to hell. Well, that's the truth. So yes, we're supposed to do these things, but we're supposed to do it with a focus on eternity. And that requires the Word of God. Because the Word of God is the imperishable seed by which men are saved. Okay? We have to do the planting. So we have to be we have to be we have to be <coughs> prayerful that we don't get to a place where we're doing the good works, quote unquote, without bringing the actual love of God. I just I read this a moment ago. How, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. <coughs> Why did He do that? So that you may have eternal life. Good works without good news. That's it. Yeah, that's right. Good works without good news is bad news all the way around. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Moving right along. I'm going to go on to Matthew, or continue on, and starting in verse 5 then, right? Mm -hmm. When you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. So now we're seeing a pattern here. They have the reward in full. You're getting your reward here on earth, right? Remember, here we're going to say, store up your treasures in heaven. If you're getting a reward here in full, you put no treasure into heaven. Right? Truly I say to you, they have the reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your room, your inner room, close your door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. For they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. I'm going to go back and say what I said about the, when you give. It says, when you pray. Okay, let me ask you a question. When do you pray? Without ceasing. Aha! That's exactly the verse that I have made my, in my note. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Pray without ceasing. When when do you pray? You're supposed to be praying all the time. We've been trained so long in so many ways about what prayer is. I would I would say that most people who call themselves Christians think that prayer is talking to God. Yes. That sounds nice. Well, want to know something? I'm going to back up a half a step because I'm going to tell you that a vast number of people who call themselves Christians don't even think it's praying to God. They're going somebody else and asking them to pass the message along. Intercessors. Well, that's true. And I'm not going to mention any names, but you Catholics know who I'm talking about. <laughs> I mean, that's just a fact. Oh, uh, okay. But the fact, <laughs> prayer is not talking to, to St. Ralph. Oh, gosh, here we go. Prayer is not talking to them, but it's not even talking to God. Prayer is talking with God. It is a conversation with God. You know, it is good. We need to go before the Lord. And we need, it's all right, make your, your needs known before the Lord. Make your requests be known. That's all right. But faith comes by hearing. It doesn't come by talking. Especially it doesn't come by talking a lot of words. Because then you have transgression. Because then you have transgression. What Alice is referring to, it says in Proverbs, where there are many words, transgression is unavoidable. But it's so the the, the listening part is more important than the talking part. I am utterly, absolutely because convinced he already of that. Knows. But it's not you know it's not that doesn't mean to say that you're not you know you're not you too talking anything. to him. But it's a conversation. It's conversation is is bi-directional. We need to be speaking to the Lord, but we need to be 
If you're not hearing from the Lord, if you're not listening to what He has to say when you talk to Him, you're not going to grow in faith. You're not going to know what He has in that particular situation, and you're going to get in trouble. You're going to you're going to get in, you're going to have transgression in your life. But prayer is a continual thing. You know, if this were not so, let me ask you: pray without ceasing. I I said at the beginning of this. 18 weeks ago, and I'll say it many, many times, I am a literalist. I actually am a Bible believer. I believe what the Word of God says. Yes. So if we are instructed to pray without ceasing, does that mean I'm not allowed to sleep at night? No, because your spirit is asleep. Well, I'm sure not sitting up talking, although I've done that once in a while. You know why? Because God can speak to you in your dreams. And God can speak to your spirit. And your spirit doesn't sleep. Your spirit doesn't have need for sleep. Your body does. right? And it says in Joel that God can speak to you in night dreams. You know, God can reveal Himself. As He's done many, many times in many places in Scripture. That's prayer. If God is speaking to you then, that's prayer. I, I share this. I, don't, I, know I've, I, well, I don't know if I've shared this before. I think I shared it with you guys once. I, Alice and I had an experience. I had an, one time. I know I've been saved for a long time. And no, we've been married for a long time. Yes, we have been married a long time. Yeah. You're right. And this is, and we've never, okay. and we've never had this before, happen before. No, this one, one time. time. I, I went to sleep, and it, while I was sleeping, I started to sing in my sleep. I mean, this is like a, I'm dreaming, but now all of a sudden I'm conscious of the fact that I'm sleeping. But it's like being wide awake, and I can—I mean, I—I I can't explain it better than that. And I'm singing praises to God, and all of a sudden, oh, this is tough for me now. All of a sudden, other voices are joining in, and the next thing I know, there are just incredible, inc in a vast innumerable number of voices and we're singing praises to God. It was the most wonderful thing that I have ever experienced. It wasn't a dream. It was a night vision. I mean it was so it was so different than a dream. And I'm conscious of this. And it's just going on and on and on. And I just my the joy is like busting out of me. Just when I woke up, the house is having the same thing. I mean, how do you explain that? It was just, it was, I, and it, you know, it's not like, okay, well, I want that tonight. I'd love to have it again tonight. <laughs> but it hasn't been, you can't turn it's that amazing. on and off. Yeah, but it happens. Sad. If that's not prayer, if that's not communing with God, well, I don't know what is. So, you can pray without ceasing. But the important thing is, be, be made aware of this. When you go to work on Monday, you better do it prayerfully. Whatever work you do, you are not to turn it off because you have entered into a different place or a different realm. There is no different realm. Your citizenship is in heaven, Paul wrote to the Philippians. You are part of the kingdom of God. That doesn't change whether you're walking into work, walking into McDonald's, or walking into a cathedral on the corner. It is always the same thing, and you are always to be in prayer. Because how are you going to do this thing we just talked about? To be able to give at the instruction of the Lord if you're not listening to the Lord. And if God is speaking to you about you see somebody, it says if you see your brother in need, if you see your brother in need, you better, the first thing you better be doing is having a conversation with the Lord. Or be listening to the Lord. And he because, cares about absolutely well, everything he does, in but our life. I'm going to tell you something. A lot of times, a lot of times when it comes to giving, for example, it is much easier to drop a fiver in a bucket than it is to get your life involved with somebody else's life. That's true. Mm -hmm. And and you know what? That that dollar, five dollars, ten dollars is a cheap way out, oftentimes. Whereas what the Lord would have you do is become involved. You know what's a great example of that? The Good Samaritan. You know, the religious people walk by and pray for this guy. But the Samaritan comes along, what does he do? He takes him. And then cares for him. And makes arrangements for him. He becomes involved in the situation. Read the Gospels. 
and see how many times Christ on the street, not sitting in the temple teaching, becomes involved in somebody's life. Now, think about this. How many times did he stop and start talking to somebody or heal somebody or do something? All the time. Yet he said he didn't speak anything that he didn't hear from the Father. He didn't do anything that the Father didn't tell him to do. So you know what that means? Each and every encounter that he has here, he is involved in prayer, communicating with the Father, speaking what the Father has told him to speak. Right? I told you when we started this, if you look at this, one of the phenomenal things about this is the fact that before Christ preached the sermon, he spent a night in prayer on this mount. A night in prayer, what was he doing? He's getting the sermon from the Father. He didn't make this up. I'm telling you the truth. He didn't get it on .com. So when you pray, yeah, right. Yeah, they have the internet. You could have gone right to sermons.com. But that's another story. I'm not going there. But we need to get to this place where we understand that this prayer is just an, it's like Alice and I. I mean, there, and I'll tell you something. There are times when we can spend time together and we, there's nothing verbal between us. But there's a connection. There's a, there's a presence. There's just a, a being a consciousness of each other. That's still prayer, still communing with one another. So we got to pray without ceasing. All right. Just, just, just a, just a point. I, I think one of the things that we find from my own experience in the body of Christ for a while is that most of our prayers in most Christian circles are directed towards Christ. And He came that we would be reconciled to the Father. And if He only did and, and spoke the things, did the things the Father was doing and spoke the things the Father was saying, that would be a model to us that our communication needs to be with the Father. And at least from my experience, that is a relationship that most people don't have. And there, boys and girls, you have a preview of the next session of this Bible study because that's exactly what Jesus said. He said, okay, here's the model of how you should pray. When you pray, pray this way. And it starts, our Father. And Bob is exactly right. I, you know, And it's not that you do this to discount or you know, diminish, no, diminish no, Jesus no, Christ. No, but you're exactly right. Is He's pointed us to the Father. And the, the thing is, and I mentioned before about who you pray to, we pray to the Father, but Christ is our intercessor and the only intercessor. That's what it says in the Word. There is one intercessor. There is one intercessor between God and man, man Christ Jesus. So yes, we, we can go, we speak to the Father. We can speak to the Father through Jesus, but our, we, our communication is to the Father. The reconciliation is to the Father. We're dealing with something now that is truly the mystery of Christianity, which is the Trinity, the presence of God in three persons. Yes. But I, I agree with you 100% that, that I have seen churches where the God, our Father, you wouldn't, you wouldn't even know that there's an existence of God the Father. And you know, you, you say that, and it makes me think. A man came to Jesus and said, what's the highest commandment? And Jesus said, Shema Yisrael, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. I've been to so many churches where they've kind of discounted the Holy Spirit because that's not their theology. And I've said to them, you can't pick and choose what parts of God. You can't have two-thirds of God. But we've often done that, and we have one-third of God. Or in some churches, you know, the one-third that we, the one-third we discount is the Father, and it's all about the Holy Spirit and Jesus. So how do you find this proper balance? By just paying attention to the Lord. And, you know, but here's the instruction, and we will get into this next time, not, not this time. You know, that Jesus gives us a model for prayer. And that model starts by saying, okay, you're talking to your Father, our Father. So that's, that's a very good point. Okay, so anyhow, Paul over and over talks about we should be devoted to prayer. We're devoted to a lot of different things, uh, you know. But we should be devoted to prayer. He said that to the Colossians, to the Ephesians, to the Romans. Right? And then the other thing that we're, I want to deal with before we leave here is meaningless repetition. Right? Um, Praying by rote. 
Hey, well, that's exactly, you know, I, God spoke through the prophet Isaiah, which is going back now almost 2,800 years. Um, but then Jesus quotes this when he says, you know, I'm going to read the one from Mark, and it appears a couple of different places. Jesus said to them, and he said to them, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. He was also saying to them, You're experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to hold to your tradition. But what he's quoting there is what he spoke God spoke to Isaiah. And this is Isaiah 29, 13. And he says, The Lord said, Because his people draw near with their words and honor me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts far from me, and their reverence for me consists of tradition learned by rote. So a lot a lot of prayers just become habit, and it just becomes words that pour out, you know, by rote. Rather than how would it, I, you know, this sounds silly, and I don't know that I can do it, man. How would it walk? Maybe it's not silly. If you walk in every afternoon and say to your wife, I love you, I love you. But it's, it's just become a habit. It's, it's, not, it's not your heart, exp or it's not your mouth expressing what's in your heart. And that's what it's talking about here. They go in here with their lips, but their heart is far from me. It's got a nation. It says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But the devil's a liar by nature and the father of lies. And it's possible for people to speak things that's not in their heart. Right? In the long run, you're always going to find out what's in their heart by listening to their words. But but the fact is, we have to be get, be careful we don't get to the place where we're just saying things because it's the word we've been trained by rote. I flew in the U.S. Navy a long, long time ago. I mean, century ago. Different century. And I kept that plane up by praying a particular prayer to a particular person. Okay. I'm, 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 I'm not, not saying that. I'm not going to say the hell Mary either. So, but anyhow, you know, I realize, what, what, what is this? It's like, it's, it has become, it's like voodoo. Yeah, yeah. It's a superstition. Yeah, and when I was young, my mother, when I, when I started driving a car, my mommy wouldn't let me drive a car unless it had a St. Christopher's medal in it. That's superstition. It's voodoo. You know, that's, it has to be your heartfelt passion that you are expressing with your lips. And saying it more and more and more. It's not by your many words. It's not by meaningless repetition. Prayer doesn't have to be long. And I'm going to say this, boys and girls. Some of you may get upset. It doesn't have to be King James. I mean, yeah, really. I, I, nothing wrong with King James English, but it doesn't have to be. I will tell one of one incident, and then we're going to, I think, close out for this time. Yes. Years ago, we were at a home where we had a lot of fellowship, and we had, actually had services and everything, and somebody there owned a Cadillac. And they were having trouble with this Cadillac. This was on Davenport Neck in Rochelle, New York. And I said, well, why don't we pray for that? Wait a minute. Pray for a car? You pray for everything that's a concern to you. So I said, let's go out and pray for the car. They, they, the, the person that owned this wasn't able to start it at the moment. So we went out, a bunch of us went out, and I laid hands on the hood of the car. Oh, you're not going to like this. I just, I got myself into a mess here. I laid hands on the hood of the car, and I said, please, Daddy, fix the caddy and turned around and walked away. Well, after being very upset with me, somebody got into the car and turned the key and it started. <laughs> I mean, I'm not trying to be irreverent, but when do we get to the place where Abba, Father, means something to us? Yes. When do we get to the absolutely. place that he's not only Father, but he's Daddy? Yeah, when do we get to the place where we absolutely. understand that we're not convincing him to do something because of our eloquence yeah. or because we've said it properly. He's doing something for us because he loves us. Absolutely. When are we going to begin to understand prayer? 
you know what? When you really begin to understand it, there will never be a question of when you pray. Because you're going to be praying. When you get to that place where you understand that love of God the Father, it's never going to be a question of when you should give, because you'll always know when to give. This is what this is all about. It's about the heart of the matter. It's about living a righteousness that is generated from the word that God has written on the tablets of your heart, from the love that God has poured into your heart, and it begins to become this abundant, joy-filled life that Jesus said that He came to give us. And you will know what it means to be blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the... Um, because you will live in the fullness of those blessings that come from this. Thank you, I got it. <laughs> well, praise God. Next time, who knows where we'll be. We're up, as I said, we're on our way right now uh, aboard the ship to Brest and then Cherbourg in France. And then we'll be making our way over to England and uh, spending some time in England. And we'll, we'll be in England for a couple of days and then headed up to North Wales. And then wherever the Spirit of God leads us. So you just make sure that you keep us in your prayers because we need it. Amen. And remember we have a, a prayer line. If you need prayer for anything, write to us at BibleTalk.com and tell us what that prayer request is. We've got a lot of faithful people praying around the world. And we just, we just love you, and we're, we're blessed that you can be with us here. So I'm going to ask you again, Bob, if you kind of close us out in a prayer, all right? Father, we just thank you. We just thank you that you love us, care for us. And, Father, this day, you want to have fellowship with yes, your children. Yes. So, Father, we want to walk hand in hand with you today. Father, refresh our hearts today. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Until next time, may the Lord our God bless you and use you for the glory of His name.